Welcome to the Know Your Legacy podcast. I'm your host, Fee, and today's guest is Mario Armstrong. Mario is an Emmy Award winner and a digital lifestyle expert. He's the host of the Never Settle Show and has made appearances on Steve Harvey, Dr. Oz, and many others. And he's also the host of his own podcast, Wake Up and Level Up. Mario, thank you so much for being here, man. Hey, V, it's my pleasure to be on the show, man. Thank you so much. I'm really excited. Been checking out your podcast ever since I got turned on to you. I was like, whoa, what is... And then I looked and I was like, you've been interviewing everybody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, 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 most definitely. I'm honored to be here. No, I'm, I'm you know, when I, when I saw the the show that you had and, and you know i watched some of the stuff that you were doing i thought yeah i think we'll make a, a good conversation together that you know that people can really get some value out of so i'm glad that we made this happen finally um but the first thing i guess before anything else if you know for those who don't know what your show is about can you tell us a little bit about why is it called never settle how'd you come up with that name what does it mean and um how the show was born yeah that's a great question um so the show was really born out of a long journey of when you're an entrepreneur or when you're a dreamer or a doer, you have to have a real clear vision for what you want to actually go after. It can't just be a lofty dream. It has to be something that you can really visualize, that you can really see yourself potentially doing, the people that would be there, the partners that would be involved, what it really looks like at the end, what the impact should feel like or taste like or be like. Like you got to really dig into it. And I would say early on, several years ago, we wanted to create a show. That, that's all we knew. We didn't know what the name was, but we knew we wanted to create a like full on high quality TV level production, multiple cameras, people in studio, guests on set, a live band or DJ, like a really blown out production, but still be a genuine conversation with doers, creators, and people that are trying to make and are making things happen, but have a conversation that was like relatable and accessible and a lot more fun than like a stiff shirt type of structured conversation. And so that was the dream to create that type of environment and that type of content that would have that type of impact for our generation and below. And so when we started doing that, I think it was one day that I actually was tweeting and I tweeted out, I tweeted out some motivational phrase or some quote or something I said. And then at the end, I just hashtagged it like never settle. And I just saw like so many tweets coming back at me like, yeah, never settle. That's right. Never settle. Like the quote didn't even matter. They were all, everybody was latching on to the fact that I said this like hashtag never settle. And that's when it kind of hit us like, well, wait, never settle really speaks to what the show, what we're, what we've been talking about, what we've been feeling like not giving up. You're not going to call a show not giving up. So we, we were like, what speaks to resiliency? What speaks to persistence? What speaks to perseverance? What speaks to getting back up and going after it, even when all the chips have been knocked down and you feel like you just have just, you don't feel like you can do it. You just have self hate going on. You just, your self doubt is happening. You feel like you're a failure. Like, what does that mean? And we were like, it's, it means to never settle. Like, that's it. And at that moment, we tested it with something that we did on Facebook. We tried a Facebook group, and we called it uh, the Never Settle Club. And the club was our way of kind of seeing, do people like this phrase? Do they get it? Uh, what's the, we would, I would start doing mentorship and, and really trying to deliver thoughts and ideas of what we thought we would deliver in a full on show. We kind of did it in this Facebook group. So it was almost kind of like our pilot before the pilot to kind of test the idea, but we were really giving people valuable information. And once we saw that that was kind of kicking up steam and taking off about a year after that, we were like, yeah, we just need to do what we're doing for the never settle club and turn that into a TV show. And how old were you when that all started to come together? Oh man. I mean, this is going back like, I mean, when we started this dream, this is, this is a 10, this is a 10 year dream, brother. <laughs> like, like this isn't uh, something that happened for us overnight. So, I mean, <clears throat> you know, I was in my thirties at the time and cranking out this idea. Um, no, even earlier, like, yeah, like early 30 cranking out the idea and trying to come up with this concept. And 
really, you know, pushing on this dream because you have to still keep the business afloat. You still have to pay bills. You still have to figure out what products and services can you sell. If, if you're the product, in our case, I was the product, how am I, how am I generating an income? And then on top of all of this, my wife and I were in business together. So a lot of times, maybe some of the people you talk to, you know, they're in business with themselves or they have a company and other people like our checks, our income was completely tied to the success of this business or the failure of this business because it wasn't like we had another income to kind of lean off on. And we were raising our son, Christopher, at the same time. But from 2007 through 2011, we were flat broke, no money. I was taking change out of the sofas to try to go to what in, you know, in the States we have these machines called the coin star machines where you drop in coins at the grocery store and it spits out real money, spits out dollars. Um, and it was just tough. I mean, it was, it, ch- it tried our marriage. Um, it, it really pushed us up against, I remember sitting in the Starbucks parking lots several times, not affording coffee, but just crying because I had to get away from my, I didn't want my wife to see me like that. Cause I felt like I was the one that, told us we can make this dream happen. And I felt like I was a complete failure for my family and for myself. And so um, getting through that made us stronger. I even screenshotted my bank account when we were flat broke. In fact, we were, we were so broke, we were negative money. And I screenshotted it. And sometimes when I do my presentations, I'll show it because I feel like it's a, um, a way to show people like you aren't the only one that's ever been there either. And that's, some people have worse stories. Some people have been homeless. Some people have been abused. Some people have really lost family members um, tragically. So everybody may have their own version of how they had to pick themselves back up. But ours was having a certain, being used to a certain level of income, being two full-time people that worked full-time and had great careers and were doing six-figure incomes to then, having all of that go away, wiping out your 401k, even though we had savings, even though we had credit, like we did all the right steps that everybody in the financial industry told us to do. It doesn't, it didn't matter because at a certain point, you know, you are going to do this as an entrepreneur or you're not. Either you're going to work for someone else or you're going to figure out how to not do that. How long did you have, how long did you have the dream before you executed on it? Um, that's a great question. I would say that we were always executing. The good thing about life is that you're always executing. When you have a vision, the vision may not be ex- is, is, ex- exactly clear, but you know, like, here's the product or the service or the impact or the thing we want to accomplish. And then you start reverse engineering. You start backing from that to say, how do we get to that? The funny thing about life is, as long as you have some type of goalpost out in the distance, you, you will start to do things in your experiences that prepare you for that. You don't really see that as it's happening. You look back at your past and you say, oh, I feel like I wasted so much time or I would have done this or I would have done that. And the truth of the matter is you needed to go through those things in order to get you to where you are today. Now, I would also say, unless you've taken some kind of detour and because something else happened along the way and you really did lose focus. But if you always have focus, um, for us, the, the short answer to that question is that it was always evolving because the Never Settle show came probably in the last four years, but the seven years prior to that, we were shooting a, a, a um, makeover show, like a pilot for a reality show that was going to do a similar type of impact, similar type of feel good thing, but that was more of what the networks were looking for at the time. So I would say that the actual Never Settle show is a culmination of a lot of past experiences that have now bottled up into this one really focused vision. But I, so, but I would say if you had a number, I would say probably four years ago is when the idea actually hit. Okay, amazing. Yeah, so it's, it's crazy to see, you know, some of the memories that you've been telling me of where you were to where you are today. Because as I, you know, watching some of the episodes on YouTube, it's like I see you running around having fun. Like you, you know, you've got full confidence and charisma on camera. Were you always that way, or is that a, a, something that you de- developed in your ca- character because you thought, okay, I need to be this type of person 
for this type of show? Or was Ooh. it that, you know, I'm already this person, I just need people to catch up to me? Great question. This is so important because I fully believe that you could approach that, that exact question one of those two directions I could have taken. And I think a lot of people meet this fork in the road and they start saying, do I, am I good enough with myself? Do I have with, within me what it takes? Can I accentuate my uniqueness? Can I accentuate my gifts and play to my strengths and build something that's really powerful off of that? Or do I feel like I need to fit into some other mold or represent some other kind of feeling to kind of brand myself that way? You know, at the end of the day, if that brand or that mold isn't true to you, it's going to come out at some point. So what I, what I, my answer to you is we went with what I was strong with. We knew that I was comfortable speaking. We knew that I was comfortable being in front of audiences, that I was given a gift to be able to communicate with excitement and energy and meaning and passion and, and relatability and transparency and vulnerability. Like I'm willing to go vulnerable where most people aren't willing to go vulnerable. And I think by doing that, it helps people understand like I'm really no different than you are. I just have a set of principles or a set of, a set of formulas or rules or, or standards that I try to follow, but I'm human. So I'm going to slip and fall and I'm going to have to get back up. And there are certain things that I'm not strong at. And there's certain things that I'm really great at. So we played to my strengths. We knew that I was um, energetic. We knew that I had the ability to do well on camera. I think it goes to also be a very important point. Four years ago, I didn't say I just want to create a TV show and be in video. Seven years before that, when I was working a full-time job, I was pitching myself to radio stations and to TV networks to work for them for free because I knew I wanted to break in. This is what I mean about like having a really strategic vision and really saying, okay, well, if I want to be in the TV business, not the YouTube business, not to bash YouTube, but the TV business is different. I have times, I'm live or not live, we're going to hit a commercial break, I only have a certain amount of time to say things because we're in a segment, like, you just, it's a different beast, much like live radio is a different beast, um, so, than it is to just podcast, because you're in more control, so, my point is, when you really know that you want to go and do something and you don't have the skill set out of the gate, maybe you didn't go to college for that. Maybe you didn't make it to college, but you want to go into something and you determine what that is. It's time for you to figure out how to work for free in order to build up that experience. So figure out how you're going to pay your bills, minimize your life, minimize your debt, do the sacrifices because that's what it takes and then figure out how you can do it. And that's all I did. I just, I did a radio show like a half hour, these people gave me a shot and I did a little half hour show and the next thing you know, I wanted to figure out how to make that bigger and how to make it bigger. And then I went to a TV station local, at the time it was in Baltimore, and I said, hey, what if I come on every Thursday morning for the news and I give a tech tip? I just, I wanna give technology tips. My expertise back then was really heavy on technology. And they were like, sure, we're not gonna pay you anything. And I was like, no, 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 I don't want anything. I, I, every Thursday, I just want you to call it Tech Tip Thursdays and I come in and I'll do like a three minute segment. Your anchor can interview me and ask me questions and I'll bring products and devices and we'll do demos and stuff. I ended up doing that damn thing for like three years at no cost. I would go to that TV station. I don't care, you know, it's five o'clock in the morning. I got to get up, go to that TV station. And then after I do my TV hit, I then go to work and do my day job. And it was like that for like two, three years of no pay. So that gave me the training. That gave me the experience. And that let me know like, oh, you can do this. And you can do this at a bigger level. So why don't we start looking at how you get to bigger markets? So it's almost as if you're putting yourself in a, a position to get small wins and to build up the confidence and to get your name out there at the same time as getting paid. All at the same so time. That's, that's exactly, that's spot. That's the best summary I've ever heard somebody put it in. That's exactly right. Like that's a great takeaway for people to really write down those steps that you just said, because when you are, you know, first off, when, when you need to acquire new knowledge or new expertise, you have to be comfortable getting into that uncomfortable space. And a lot of people hesitate because of fear of embarrassment or they're really just scared or they've tried something before and they, 
didn't like what happened and they don't want to go through that pain again. But the truth of the matter is the only way you grow as a person is by putting yourself in those uncomfortable situations. So to your point, do smaller, uncomfortable situations. Too often we go too big and so the fall feels so heavy that we don't really want to ever do something like that again because our brains and the way we're designed as humans is to protect ourselves. We, we want to do what's comfortable. We'd rather be safe. We want to be secure. So when you, when you know that that's in our DNA, just from caveman history to where we are today, Neanderthal to now, it's, it's important to understand that that's already your wiring that's there. So do smaller wins, smaller uncomfortable steps that help to build the confidence along the way. Most, most definitely. And I'll, I'll just add to that before I go into the next question and say that what I've realized along my journey so far is that it's all a brain game. Like that's, that is your computer. And so if you understand how this works, you can trick it. You can play it how you want to play it. And as you said, if you try and do something big for the, and you've got no experience, no connections, nothing, it may not work out straight away. Most likely than not, you have to learn certain things along the way. So it won't work. And if you fail, then it'll, it could turn you away forever. So having the small wins tricks your brain into thinking you're a winner, you're a winner, you're a winner. And then you'll go for bigger and bigger risks and eventually end up on CNN. No, this is true. This is true. Um, I want to say something too, because you bring up a word that I love to grab when it happens. And then that word is fail. I love this word because this word is so, it's so, it's full of stigma, it's full of power, and it really handicaps people. It, it, it is a psychological straitjacket for so many people. So I want to help people really quickly do something that I've done that's helped me change perspective on this word. I don't want you to say the word fail anymore. What you say in place of fail is learn. In place of failed, learned in place of failing learning so i didn't i didn't fail in that relationship i learned in that relationship i didn't fail doing that idea i learned doing that idea if you start to understand that failure is completely a prerequisite to success you cannot have success without learning something along the way to beat you down to make sure this is something that you're really committed to. So I say, instead of thinking of it as failure, I say, you only fail if you just don't try. That to me is a true failure. When you know you have a gift, when you know you have a vision, when you know you have an idea, but you're allowing either self-doubt or external forces like friends and family to dream kill on you, to make you feel like you can't do something that internally you feel like you should be doing, that's when it hits failure because now you're not sharing your gift with the world and everybody's got to get their first version out there in order to get the, in order to get your big vision out there, you got to get your first version out there. And so many people are hesitant to do that. And I think if you just change your mindset from no longer saying fail, only saying learned, you will try more because when you try, you either win or you learn, but you never lose. Yeah, most definitely. And I, I completely agree with everything that you've said. It, it's in line with all the other people that I've spoken to or interviewed or even books that I've read. It's just over time you realize failure isn't this, it, it's not an event um, that, that, right. e- that ends the whole process. It's, no. it's, it's literally, this, it's the same journey of success. It, it's, it's part of it. It's not anything, like you're still, you're heading in that direction. As, I mean, long, as, well, you don't, as long as you don't quit, you will end up there. The door will open. Like it's not a different thing. The shirt I'm wearing right now. Let me see. If I, the shirt I'm wearing right now reads, "Fail fast." <laughs> like basically like that, get to success quicker. That's it. That's what it means. It. Like fail fast. Like big, huge letters, like in your face. <laughs> like, like failing fast means you're going to get to your end result quicker because you're learning along the way. I mean, failing fast. You know, is it? technical turn that was really used for programming and really being able to identify where the shortcomings are in a program before you get too far into building or coding. But it applies to life in the same way. The faster you can correct, 
You can course correct yourself. The faster you realize, oh, my relationship is kind of falling off the rails. I better start to pull it in. The faster you can see, oh, I'm not really being a great dad to my kid, or I'm missing too many of his events or, or her events, or um, you know, I'm noticing that we're losing some clients. And instead of trying to like not really pay attention to it, you catch it sooner. All of this is called failing fast. That's helping you actually win longer because you can pick up on the things that could take you down a very bad path over the long haul. So yeah, I mean, it's all the same philosophy. It's just how you think about it in different ways. A friend of mine named Charlie, he thinks about it as winning streaks. Everything is a winning streak. So even getting that cup of coffee for the first thing in the morning, if that's what you do, you claim that as a winning streak. Like I got this cup of coffee, all this greatness is in this one cup. I'm gonna, this is a start to my winning streak. And basically what we're also saying is psychologically, it activates the reticular activating system uh, or the RAS, as many people call it. And for those that don't know, it's just a small piece of brain matter at the back of the skull, like by your brain stem, about the size of a number two pencil. Um, and basically it filters uh, every, all the noise that's out there and listens to what you have said is a priority to you. And it will start to present those things that you keep talking about or keep asking for or keep thinking of, that stuff will start to rise to the surface and you'll see it more often. It's the same reason why if you say you're interested in getting a new Toyota that's a black whatever version, all, the start, all of a sudden you start seeing that new Toyota everywhere you go. And you're like, I keep seeing it everywhere. No, it's because your reticular activating system said this is a priority to you because you keep talking about wanting this car. So in the same way that you can reinforce positive, imagine the flip side. If you keep telling yourself, I'm not great, or I'm not good at something, or I never will be successful, or yeah, that was a dumb idea. If that's the autoplay that's happening, the reticular activating system can't distinguish between positive and negative. It's just going with what you're feeding it. And it's just saying, oh, well, then I'm just going to keep showing you things that remind you of this negative energy that you keep telling me that you have an interest in. Yeah, most definitely. And it's, it's, we're the ones that are in control of that. So we, we choose That's our correct. words wisely. We choose our focus wisely. That's what you'll get. Again, it comes back to the computer. You, if you put a virus in the computer, what are you going to see on the screen? A virus. That's how <laughs> sure. So um, while we're on this topic, like, are there any distinct memories that you have when you think back to the transition of being in that full-time job to putting yourself out there and you know the doors constantly shutting or they're not opening and and you know if you can shed some light on some of those stories so yeah. that people who are listening they know that you've been there and done that oh yeah i mean and i think the i think really the, the step even before that is even harder like the step of when you're working a full-time job or you or you're getting your bills paid but you have this passion or this side hustle and you're like when do i make the leap like when is it safe now for me to make the jump? Is, how do I know? Do, I feel like the job now is starting to frustrate me because I hate my job because I really want to go and do my thing. Like you start feeling these really weird emotions and then you start getting upset at the place that's actually giving you the paycheck. You know, that feeling where you're like, I don't want to be here anymore, but they are paying you. Yeah, I know, but I don't want to be. So it's this constant battle of when is the right time. And for everyone, that's going to be a different cadence and a, a different moment. I don't believe in, I'm not the guy that's gonna tell you jump off the cliff and build the wings on the way down. That's not me. Some people say, well, I need to feel completely out and in order to commit. If you know that's who you are, and if you know that's how you best operate, then jump your ass off the cliff and build the wings on the way down because clearly you've done that before in some other stage in your life. Maybe when you joined that soccer team that everyone told you you couldn't make, or maybe when you made that goal or you became that, that cheerleader that no one ever thought you could do. Like at some point you did that before. So if you know that's you, then sure. But for the, for the most of us, you know, jumping off can be scarier than, than just taking your time. I think it's always best to have a day job or have an income while you're trying to get your side hustle going because it can help, you, it can help really uh, build it. Uh, for me, that was the biggest contention is understanding when. So once I started recognizing that we were making some income, 
nowhere near where I was because we were making six figure income, but I was making some income with this side hustle. That's when I started to take it serious that, oh, this has potential. Can, can we really do, if I was to put more hours, more time into it, can I actually take the side business and get close to matching my income? And the truth was I couldn't do that. So that's when I talked to my wife and I said, look, you've been running two other companies as a COO. She was employed by two other companies. I said, why don't you come run this idea? I, right now it's a hobby to me, but I think we can really turn this into something. If you come on and do the economic models and do that, I'll do the creative and we'll split duties. And that's, and I kind of convinced her to do that. And then we started getting notes. <laughs> so imagine taking the leap, you protect yourself as much as you can because we're also raising our son. So you have your, your, your money saved and you're trying to be very fiscal about what you're doing and everything is looking good. We had a 250, no, $287,000 deal with AOL at the time that was really going to launch the company. So we went and did our paperwork. We did our LLC. We filed for all of our stuff. And um, a, a, the day that we were, Basically, long story short, the day that we were signing the contract with them, they do signing parties at AOL. So we were on our way in the car, on, uh, in Virgi on our way to Virginia, and we got the phone call that basically the deal wasn't happening because there was a new CEO that just came in two days prior. And the guy that I had been dealing with on the phone, David, he didn't have the guts to tell me two days ago that this wasn't happening because the new CEO came in and put a hold on all contracts. And so he decides to tell me 45 minutes before we arrive, <laughs> that this isn't happening. And so at that moment, our, our world just kind of crashed. And that was our first big no of holy crap, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna survive? And then the recession hit and it just started spiraling out of control. So at that point, it just became fight for survival. So at that point, it was just hustle to get any potential contract or deal. To, so we were doing 250 bucks there, 500 there, 1,000 here, 2,000 there, anything to just try to pay the bills and keep the lights on. Nicole's on the phone with credit card people trying to tell them that when they're going to send the payment, knowing she doesn't have it. And then she's like trying to use one credit card to pay another one's bill. Like it's just getting really crazy and like chaotic and messy and um, – once we kind of started to level out, once the recession kind of stopped, and once we started to level out a little bit with getting clients to still come to us, that's when we came up with the big idea of pitching the show. And right out of the gate, we were getting no's. It was the most frustrating. When you put your baby together and you put a lot of time in preparing your presentation or your product or your proposals or your pitch decks, and you're thinking about all the angles on how they're going to come at you and the objections that you're going to get and how you can show that you can sh strengthen your weaknesses because they're going to like pinpoint your weaknesses on you. And you're like preparing, you do all of that. And you're like, we got something. We know people are going to want this. We hear that people really are into it. And to just get, <laughs> for, you know, the hardest thing really is, man, it's just when someone else, I don't care if they're your parents or your cousin or your friend, when someone doesn't believe in your vision or they just don't see it, it just straight up, that shit just straight up hurts because you are so vest, you're so invested into what your potential is and what you see. And when someone else doesn't see that, that if they did see it could make a significant difference in your life, that's where it kind of hurts because you're just like, well, is it me? Is it this idea? Is this, is this not going to work? And so then you start really questioning, you know, your concept, your strength, your ability to get it done. And we've been through it. I mean, I was on the, let me just put it in, I'll just paraphrase this really quick. I was on the Today Show. I'm on TV with Al Roker, with all these people. Like I'm on the show as a regular the people inside of even NBC know me and see me on air. I'm getting a paycheck, like a contract. And I went to them with the idea. And, and I'm not taking a shot at them. It's just a thing in the business. They didn't see the value at that moment for this idea. 
They thought that my idea was too aggressive. They thought that it was um, too complicated. And they didn't think that people really wanted anything that was of educational and informational value in an entertaining way. They really felt people just really want entertainment. And that's really all they wanted. And so they kind of made me, in that meeting, I kind of felt like the stepchild. I kind of felt like, the little, oh, Mario came in with this cute little idea and he's so, he's so passionate about it, but he has no clue what it really takes to pull off that type of vision. And I think I was underestimated. Um, and I understand that. It happens all the time. A lot of times, all of us are underestimated until we do something. And then they all go, oh, I knew he was going to make it. <laughs> or I knew he was going to be able to get that thing done. <laughs> and now the phones ring or they want to talk or what have you. So you just have to constantly be in that moment of, you know, proving it to yourself and always trying to be better today than you were yesterday for you not for anybody else. So through, I think you might have just answered it, the question I'm about to ask just towards the end there, but if there's anything else you can add to this, why you're going through all of that, how do you stay positive? Mm. So hard. I mean, it starts with your support system. So it starts with like, who are the people that are around you? Um, because you know, there are a lot of dream killers that live right in our homes. They don't even know sometimes that they're dream killing, unfortunately. But by telling us, you know, you sh maybe you shouldn't go after that particular degree or, or maybe you should go back to school as opposed to trying that thing. It's these little subtle things that can really feel like knives in our hearts when people are really trying to pursue their passion or their idea. And so, you know, one of the things that you have to deal with and one of the things that I did is I just had a heart to heart with my family and I would say, hey, look. You know, when you say things this way, not my wife, because she was on board, but like other family members, when you say things like this, and I would give them an example, it hurts. And sometimes they would realize, oh, I didn't even realize, like, I was just trying to look out for you. I just, you know, I see that you're struggling so much to try to make your thing happen, and I don't want you to be in that pain. It's like, yeah, I know, it's okay, but that's what we signed up for. Like, it's all right. But I, I thank you for trying to protect me. But don't do that because you're actually making me feel like I shouldn't do the thing that I feel like I should be doing. So a lot of times I'll advise people or I'll try to coach people to say, look, just ask your family members, you know, do you love me? And if they say yes, then just say, look, I don't need you to understand the vision. I just need you to support it. So a lot of times you're just getting that help. But A, finding a support system. So whether that's internal to your family or finding it external in meetups and other people, even if it's getting it from Instagram and podcasts and wherever you need to get it from, having that support system is number one. Number two, you have to watch your, you have to watch your thoughts. I, I really struggle. I mean, I have the systems now and the triggers and I know what to look for because this is my expertise, helping people be, develop their, pers their personal brand, helping people achieve their visions, pursue their passions. Like this is what, I, what I've been studying the last 10 years, but it still was a, I didn't realize how bad I talked to myself until I really started getting into understanding the, the mind and really learning and studying this area of self-help and personal development and growth. Then once I really recognized and became aware, I was like, oh my gosh. I mean, I'm comparing myself to people all the time. Like, why do they have this? How come they got that many followers? How come this thing happened for them? How come no one's seeing what I'm doing over here? Like it was, it just gets bad. And so I, I know what that feels like. So I will say to you, that's probably the biggest, most important, crucial thing is to watch your own thoughts um, and to try to get as much reinforcement from the support group outside of you. And I think for us, we made a commitment to each other. One tactical thing that we did was whenever one of us was down, the other could not be down, even if you were. So if we both woke up and we were both in a negative mindset, somebody's got to suck it up. So like, okay, Nicole, yesterday, you know, it was my shitty day and you, you took it for the team and you sucked it up. Today you're having a bad one. I'm going to get over whatever it is I'm going through and I'm going to suck it up for the team and I'm going to be the positive one today. Reading more and more material, listening to more and more podcasts and um, 
constantly feeding yourself with positive input completely makes a difference. You have to literally brainwash yourself into success. Like before you're experiencing it fully, you I, like the way I see it is you need to experience it up here mentally. Like you have to play the game and see it very clearly up here before it comes outside in front of you tangible. Like I think that's where people fall down and you can tell me if I'm wrong from the people you've spoken to in your experience, but it, it where most people seem to fall down is from seeing it here and seeing it up here and, and staying with it long enough right for them to then see it in their reality somewhere in the middle of seeing it here and seeing it in the reality that's where they just quit and stop and it, it's it's in that make it closing that gap of from here yep. to here that's you you can't because you don't know if tomorrow is going to be the day and that's what that's right. one of the things that that kept me going like I, i've mentioned this in other podcasts with guests is like i had a skin condition that really held me back for years and mm. i had confidence issues and you know self-esteem yep. all of that stuff yep threw me back because I, I held my image quite highly in my mind. Right. But, but it was, it was the, the thought of, Oh, next month I'll be better. Next month I'll be better. Next week, tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. And then six years went on and I kept playing that game of, of hope and belief yeah. in, my, my, in my mind. And then the medication worked and you know, I, it started, everything started going in the right direction and I felt better about myself. But if someone had said to me at the start, Oh, it'll take six years. Right. Right. It would, I, don't, I don't know how I would have handled that because in my head, six years, how can you stay positive for that long knowing right. that it's so far away? When you play the game in your head that, oh, it could be tomorrow, 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 and you do that long enough, eventually it comes. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a great point. You're, you said so many things. This is, this, was, this is like eventually tomorrow, right? Like tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. And then I even did a post that was very similar to that on Instagram. Um, I try to do a lot of mentorship and a lot of DM conversations and a lot of positive stuff on IG. Um, and one of the posts that I wrote was, you work, you work, you work. And then one day, it's tomorrow. So imagine me going through the, 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 the broke bank accounts, not having the money, digging into the sofa for change, getting crappy deals to try to keep the lights on, having arguments with my wife, wondering if we made the biggest mistake ever. And it's almost like putting a fork in between our marriage and really trying us on the relationship side, trying to be there for my son to kind of see his dad not quit. My son's five. I'm, in, I'm impressionable to him. I'm like, I'm like his hero. I got to keep going. I can't show like this weakness and, and not, not that I can't be soft or weak, but he can't see me fail. I got to, he's got to see me get back up. Even if I get knocked down, like he's got to understand what resilience means and what work ethic means and what it means to pursue something you really believe in and love. And so one day is going to be tomorrow. So imagine me going through all these no's and getting rejected and not and getting shot down even when I'm at the highest game at my possible. I'm at the Today Show. Five, six million people are seeing me on TV. I've worked my butt off to be able to be someone that can do live television at a very high level very, very well, and I still can't get my own show happening. And then Friday night before the Emmy Awards – actually is hitting and you're in a hotel suite and you're surrounded by family and friends and you got a videographer shooting and documenting like all this stuff that's going on. You got the, a makeup artist and a hairstylist for like your family and friends because we bought a table of 10 and we're all going to the Emmys and we're all going to walk over from the hotel to the venue. And we don't know if we're going to win or lose, but we know we got nominated and you're like, just your rewind button of just everything flashes. And you're like, holy crap, today is tomorrow. Like we're living, today is, and then to get it, you're like, I don't want this day to ever end. <laughs> like I woke up that Sunday morning after getting it Saturday. And I was just like, I want Saturday to happen again. I don't want, I don't want, I want this, I don't want this feeling to leave ever. And it's because your point is true. You have to keep working towards your tomorrow because you never know. And I would say that there's one tactical thing that you can do along the way that works for us and has helped. And we do, we do a weekly reflection every Sunday with our three wins of the week. A lot of times when you do the it's tomorrow, 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 
when things, when you don't really start to see progress, if you are careful, that negative self thought will start start to tell you, sure it's tomorrow, sure it's tomorrow. Yeah, right. Yeah, you, know, you keep telling yourself that stuff, but it hasn't been happening. It's been going on for a year now. When's tomorrow coming, buddy? Like you know, it starts to really get heavy. So what you have to do is you have to start to recognize your small wins. And if you can be the person that can actually recognize very small things that are giving you minuscule progress, you'll actually start to realize, oh, tomorrow is getting closer. So I don't care what the win is. I don't care if it was just you had a great phone call. I don't care if it was you had a great podcast interview or uh, for, for, your, for your season. I don't care what the small win is. Always have three wins every Sunday to reflect on the previous week Watch how hard it is. It's very hard to come up with three. A lot of people can come up with two really quick. And then they're like, what did I do good last week? What did I? Some people have to go into their calendars. They got to look on their phones. Even I do it sometimes. Like, because we're not wired to remember the small wins. We only remember Emmy Awards. We don't remember all the small wins that it took me to get to that point. And those are critical to acknowledge because they give you the momentum to keep going. Yeah, I love that. Thank you for sharing that tip because I know there's people out there right now who are struggling with that and that would definitely help. And I've, I'll have i be honest, I've fallen off from doing that, but I, I used to do something similar and I should yeah. after this, I should actually implement it again, but I did something daily. So oh, what, like journaling one, or something? No no, 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 no. So I kept a, a jar. I did this all of last year. So I kept a jar um, oh. in the kitchen and I used to just get a piece of paper and just write... At, at the end of the day, just write one thing that went well, a anything, anything that okay. I'm gr grateful for, just one thing, close it and then put it in the jar and then read all of them at the end of the year. You've got 365 things you're grateful for. I <laughs> love it. So that definitely helps as well. If, if it's something that you want to do daily. Yeah. Even if it's like, I used to literally write things like, I'm grateful for the ability to breathe today or to walk or to see. I saw someone who's disabled, so I'm grateful for my health. Like something yeah. like that just keeps you going. Cause you're like, you know what? I have got it together. I, I can make it through another day. And then you, yep. you keep going. So it's but, true. I mean, right now I'm using a journal. Um, and I've been doing that for probably the past year or so. I really wanted to test myself to see if this was a habit that I could actually create for myself because I know that there is power in writing things down. I always write stuff down, but I never kept it like in one place. And I always felt like if I could do that, it would really be good for me to go back and reflect. And so um, I, I think mine is called the best, I think, it, I think it's called the best journal, best journal ever or best journal. Yeah, B-E-S-T. Anyway, that's been a great daily exercise because on a daily basis, you're waking up, you're writing out what your schedule is for the day. Uh, I do it the night before. I, I look the night before, like, what's my schedule tomorrow? Even though it's in my phone, I still write down a couple of appointments and things in, in the book because it's scheduled that way. Then I look, uh, write down a couple of things I'm grateful for. Like you just said, when I first wake up, what am I grateful for? And then it asks, what's my goal of the day? What are, what, what are, what are three things that would make my day successful to me? And then at the end of the day, it's asking me, what were your wins or, and what were the lessons that you've learned? Like, what could you have done better or what did you learn from today? Not what did you fail, but what did you learn from today? And so keeping up with that is a very tough uh, commitment to do. But even if you can start doing it a few days a week at a time, then you can start doing it more often. And now, you know, it's a way for me to kind of exhale the day as well as stay focused on what my day really means to me because we get so many things thrown at us in terms of how we react. And I often say that if the first thing that we're doing is reacting when we start our day, that's all you're gonna be doing for the most part of your day. And so really attacking the thing that you're gonna procrastinate on the most or the attacking the most important thing in your day first and having some type of checkpoint system that makes, that keeps you accountable to that, it's very important and has been very helpful in us being successful. Most definitely. I think if you can take control of the first few things that you do in your day, the rest of the time is just, you, you already put yourself in a state of winning, you know, because you had yep. such a good morning. The rest of the day just goes well. Um, That's right. So on the topic of, of, of an Emmy, how does someone win an Emmy? And then <laughs> what, talk, talk me through that day of, of when you got the news, like, how was it delivered to you? Is it in the post? Like, you know, how, cause there isn't every, everyone who's listening hasn't won an Emmy, you know, for, for the most part. <laughs> 
so so the way the news gets shared to you is obviously you know you put the application in and you submitted it so you're waiting for the deadline to find out like when you're going to know if you've been nominated is it is it you so it's sorry is it you that applies for it or someone has to nominate you oh no you you can you can apply your company or your your program um, or you individually can apply for the show that you're on or for the role that you played in the show. What's really interesting about this whole story is before we even shot any, anything of the show, I went into one of our very first meetings. This is when we were first trying to feel out people and, on, and start hiring producers. I went in with this big manila envelope and I opened it up and I showed, um, I showed the senior producer at the time Andrea and she was Adrian and she was like what is that and I was like oh this is just a 65 page submission document I printed it all out for the Emmys and she's like what and she's like you don't even have a show yet I said yeah I know I said but I'm we're gonna we're going for an Emmy like we're not doing a show just to do a show and I think that's important to state because even though I had nothing to go on even though I had nothing to really to tell me we're gonna win an Emmy and I didn't know if I would, I still felt like we had to be driving at that level of excellence. So even if it was just, which it wasn't, even if it was just a Jedi mind trick for me to try to trick the team to be like, I want you to perform at your best because we're going for an Emmy. That wasn't my, my, my goal. What wasn't the Jedi mind trick. My goal was, let's, I think we can do this. Let's go for this thing and let's see what we can come up with. When you, when you submit it, you go through a very kind of laborious process and details and things you have to submit. And you're triple checking the application and all this stuff. And then you finally put it through. Um, and when you put it through, you kind of just like let it go, you release. And a lot of times I try to teach people, you know, non-attachment to stuff like, you know, do your thing and then just kind of like let it go and go back, you know, go to the next thing because more frequency is going to get you more results as opposed to just hoping that one thing is going to come through. Mm -hmm. So you find out, you, you get the word, um, let's see, we got the word via email that our submission had been nominated in two categories, that we got nominated in two categories one for host and one for interactive show. And we were just like, floor, like, oh my, not like, we, we like, cause you doubled your odds of, of potentially winning an Emmy. I didn't want to win one personally. I wanted the team to win one because if the show wins, that means other people can actually get a physical award. If I win, I'm the only one that can claim that award. They only will give one Emmy award. So I really wanted the team to win because I felt like it was just a group effort. And I just think that that's the right thing to do. Like to be a good human is to really also lead your people and empower them to be successful. And I wanted them to feel what it was like to win uh, an Emmy. And I had been fortunate enough prior to then to win one for being a host. So I was like, people need to know what this feels like. So I hope that the show wins, not me. And we got nominated and then we went to the nomination party. And when you go to the nomination party, all the nominees are there. Oh, and so you can't get in unless you're a nominee. You get into the party and then they get up on the podium and the organizers are telling you about how great it's gonna be this year. We're so glad that you all are here, blah, blah. And then you find out how many nominations there are. And then you go, oh my God, we're never gonna win. <laughs> There's like, you know, so many nominations, like thousands of nominations and, you know, in different categories. And you got shows that are from NBC and CBS and Bravo and Lifetime and, you know, Amazon and Hulu and Netflix. And you're just like, oh, there's just no way, like, we're gonna, like, get anything out of this. And um, to, to, to go to that party and still just be in that moment and just love being in that moment, like, you know what? You start telling yourself, we won because we got nominated. <laughs> That's what you start telling yourself, like, you know what? Just, just being nominated is the win. The honest answer is you want, you want to hold an Emmy in your hand. <laughs> being nominated is great, but you want to actually have that award in your hand. And so then you go to Emmy night and you're sitting there in, you know, this big venue. Everybody's, you know, glammed up and there's a red carpet and you're taking pictures and you got family members and friends and people that were involved in the show all there. And it's a long night because there's so many categories and so many uh, awards. You're literally there for about four to five hours just sitting, 
hearing other people, whether they won or lost, and you're clapping for other people for the categories, and they show it up on the big screen. They'll show a clip of the winner and all that stuff. And man, when they called the hosting category, which was the first one, and I was nominated amongst other hosts, and I lost that one. A lot of the family members and friends, they were all patting me on the back like, oh, don't worry, don't worry. And I was like, in, internally, I was like, yes. Because if, we, if I don't win on the host, we have to win for the, for the show. Like, granted, I would have loved to have had an Emmy, but I, not over the expense of my team getting to experience that. And so like two hours later, they get to the other category. <laughs> and sure enough, um, what happened, a really quick funny story, the lady fubbed, she flubbed the nomination, reading the nomination. She ended up calling a winner from a previous category, somehow or another. And we were all like looking around the table, like that's not even, that's not us, but that's also not any of the nominees. What's going on? We were like in this disillusioned state of confusion. And then there was like this quietness up at the podium and everything got quiet and other people were talking to her and then they got it all cleared up. And they were like, we made a mistake. <laughs> and then they reread our category. So you had to go through that whole roller coaster ride of excitement all over again to find out if your name got called. And I'll never forget seeing her lips because the big jumbotron screen was huge and the camera was focused on her. And I just remember her lips forming the words, ma, like a mmm. And I was like, oh, I was like, before she said Mario Armstrong's Never Settle Show, I just leaped in the air and we just went nuts. And, I, and the whole team just, we just rushed the stage and we, everybody was sitting there holding their mouths. We're just like dazed. And I'm not dazed. I'm like, yes, <laughs> you know, I'm ready to get on the podium and do my acceptance speech. And you can see it on Instagram or on my site, neversettleproductions.com. You can see the actual uh, Emmy Award speech that I did, that I gave. But um, yeah, man, that's how it goes down. Sorry for the long story, but that's kind of the roller coaster ride of what it feels like. Uh, no, I, I love no, I love that you went into detail with it because it seemed like you were going like replaying the emotions in your head and like seeing it happen in your mind because it's 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 crazy because you know you don't really get to speak to someone who's there first person like emotionally experiencing it you can see it on tv right. on youtube that's that's different though that's different because right. you're there as a third person but you were your physical presence was there so like you're feeling the adrenaline of like is she gonna say my name is she not gonna say it? and right. then the roller coaster the right. roller coaster happens like come on like i waited this long and you still have to come up with the mistake of the name but no, congrats to you, man, for, for sticking Thank you, man. Yeah. You know, go you know, it's just like, do I write a speech? Do I not write a speech? Does that jinx anything? Like, you know, all these things. And then I, I actually leave the stage. I almost left the stage without getting the award. She's holding it. And I did my speech. And then I, like, turned to roll out. Like, I forgot to even get it. It's just, it's so out-of-body experience. And then when you get it, you walk out into the lobby and everybody's just like congratulating you. And then you're taking pictures at like the, the red carpet. And it's just, it's just jaw dropping. You just have to kind of just sit in a moment. And I mean, there's a picture of it there. Um, I think, I think there's one of the whole team that I have here. Yeah. There's the whole team. I don't know how well you can see that, but that's amazing. Part, yeah. Yeah. I can see. Yeah. But yeah, man, thank you for allowing me to share that. I, I think, you know, anybody that has a big dream and a big vision should absolutely go for it and that you should always submit whatever it is in your industry that you could submit for, no matter how small or how big, you should do it. You should do it for yourself. You should do it for the teammates that are involved with you. Um, it's, it's a part of the process of recognizing your hard work and your ethic and your, and your pursuit. And so, um, I think we, a, a lot of times we may overlook submitting ourselves to things because we, we think it's not perfect or it's not ready yet. And you'll be surprised at what people look at and um, deem, deem in their, you know, your peer to peer, uh, they deem worthy of receiving some, such recognition. Yeah, just, just before I get into the final few questions, I want to touch on that because it's an important point you made about how other people in your in your in your peer group or on the same level as you see worth in your work value in your work but you might not see it and so our, our approach our approach to it is simply just the the negative self-talk that we're giving ourselves and so right. 
we our perception is distorted it's biased in that sense because yep. we think oh yep. my work's not good enough it's not ready yet but it but it is you know like it, it is ready because in someone else's eyes and i had this happen to me what like some of my earlier podcast episodes so I, I hate listening back to them because i'm just like oh that guy you know he didn't know what he was doing like you know he was nervous and he didn't really know how to ask questions but yeah, then yeah. i get messages from people about those earlier episodes saying how much it's helped them and i thought well if this isn't about me it's it's not like i'm just sharing what I've, what comes naturally to me and because i think there's value in it i'm putting it out there i don't care if it's like the best audio engineer the best equipment I, I, you know right. I, I might stutter or say uh or, um to me it's a big deal but i'm making it t you have to realize you're making it 10 times bigger in your mind than someone else um because when they see it they they're, they're not going to even notice that that's not no. what you, your focus is on that their focus is on the the story or the value that you're sharing you know yeah and and this is important to take a compliment when you get one a lot of people we're, we're so defensive that when we get a compliment we we want to deflect it and we want to say oh yeah but it could have been better or oh your hair is beautiful today oh this thing i can't wait to get a new style like you know whatever it is right like we're so quick to kind of shoot it down because we don't like the spotlight unless you're like a narcissist <laughs> you don't like the spotlight and so when that happens you deflect and what we really need to be saying is when a compliment comes our way let's accept it and let's embrace it and just say thank you so for you it's like yeah you know all the little things that you've learned over the years and you look back and you're like oh my gosh i can't believe i was like that at one point i could have been so much better but if someone else is telling you what it, what you did worked for them then you accept that and you and you'd be so thankful and so happy that your worst version hear what happened your worst version or a thing that you thought was crappy was really powerful for someone else well then what does that say about when you're on your a game like that should really make you actually feel good that well damn my stuff should really be resonating with people now you know i always tell people you know you've hit the roughest part when it's the easiest time to quit so when it really feels the heaviest is when it's usually the easiest time for you to say, forget this thing. It's, it's too much of a lift. It's too heavy. I, it's, I can't make it work. That's usually the sign for you to either figure out a small pivot or to stick with the same program and keep going. One little quick piece on that, because I think it also tails in with what you just said about like, you know, knowing you could have been better than where you are now. One of the things is a lot of times you got to re remember, like, where are you getting the responses from? If your family and friends are telling you that you're great, then that's fine. But that's one set of an audience. If complete strangers are telling you this thing did something for them, that has a much higher value that should be weighted at a much higher level because they have no reason to tell you that. And so I think when we are out pitching our ideas or when we're out trying to get something happen to happen and we get rejection, pay attention to where the rejection is coming from. Were they the right people to pitch in the first place? Because sometimes they're the wrong audience and you're getting rejection and you're thinking, oh, we need to completely change everything. And it's like, no, you don't need to change a thing about you or the product or the pitch. You actually need to change the audience that you're pitching to because they're not going to buy. They're the wrong types of buyers. So I just think it's very important when you are getting feedback and you're listening to these things that you weigh them properly based off of who they are and what that means to your ultimate vision. I love that. It gives something for people to, to think about, you know, what, yeah. what, what, whatever idea or passion they're trying to chase, they might be trying to build the wrong team or, or, or share the idea with the wrong people altogether. So no, thanks yeah. for sharing that. So just to get into the last few questions with everything that you've gone through, um, emotionally, physically, spiritually, whatever it was, is there anything different you'd tell the 18 year old Mario? Ooh. <laughs> um, I would say that um, be, be more focused, listen to your gut more, especially when, when gut and any little bit of data that you can do matches, 
that's when you're, you, you got to go. So a lot of times we operate off of gut. But if you can also do a, a short survey, if you can do a survey monkey or even just a quick Google survey with other people just to kind of get a sense, like, am I only one drinking this Kool-Aid and think it tastes great? Or is this really something good that's, that's useful? When you can get a little bit of that, I would say, I would say to that earlier one, hey, you should, get, you, should, you should get a little bit of data and you should trust your gut more and, and go a little bit heavier into that thing that you were uh, worried about going into. I would also say that your purpose must be larger than your fear of embarrassment. That I was never one to really worry too much about embarrassment, but I was one that liked to get validation from others. I wasn't really worried about, well, I look like an idiot because I did this. I didn't really, that didn't really hold me back too much because I was like, well, out of a room full of idiots, at least I'm the only one trying something. So I felt better in that sense. Um, but I, I do feel that, you know, your purpose must be larger than your fear of embarrassment or anything that would hold you back. I think that would be a big one. And then I think the only other one I would say is, to, my, to that younger self, I would say, um, and there's an African proverb that goes, uh, you can go fast by yourself or you can go farther together. And I would, I think that is something that I would have latched on to because I felt like I had to do so much and I felt like I, 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 and I think if I would have understood the power of we earlier, there's quite possibly would have been, you know, a different levels of success that would have happened sooner. Who knows? All I know is I've learned the power of we, I understand it. I preach it maybe because I had to go through that path of only thinking about I, which is why I, yeah, I had to learn what that really did to me and what that means. But I think that's what I would tell my younger self. I love that. It's, it's amazing advice. So, um, and uh, the second question is, if there's one lesson that you could leave the world with, what would it be? Um, one lesson. One lesson to, le to leave the world with? Wait, to leave or lead? Uh, leave. Leave. Yeah. What is your answer to the phrase, I will? How do you finish the phrase, I will? What will you do? What will you deliver? What will you bring? What will your DNA mean while you have this thing called life, which is a miracle that we get a shot at having? What will you do? So I will, that's how I would leave you to think and just understanding that no one gets the right to determine your destiny and that one of the other things that I will leave you with is probably some of the best advice that was ever given to me. And that was <clears throat> to always have one word that kind of defines your North Star, where you're going, what you want to accomplish. It could change every year, but have one word that kind of keeps you centered so that whenever anything else is coming at you, you can always say, oh yeah, that's right. My word this year was connection. I wanted to have a better connection with audiences. I wanted to have a better connection with uh, potential funders and sponsors. I want to have a better connection with other podcasters and people in the media. I want to have a better connection with my wife and with my kid and do more experiences with them. That was my word. But to always have that gives me a ground and gives me something to always come back to when things start getting crazy or chaotic, I can say, are you connecting? Are you doing what you said your word for the year is? Cause you, you're, you're not, you're, you need to come back to center. And then I would say the other piece is if you can find yourself an accountability partner, another human being that is goal driven, doesn't have to be in the same area, same business. None of that matters. They just need to be goal driven about something they want to accomplish in their life. And if the two of you 
can actually get on a cadence where you are there to support each other. You share what your goals are. You share what you're going to do every single week. And then at the end of every week, you sit down with each other or you get on the phone or you FaceTime and you reflect and you talk about what did you do? What did you not do? And you hold each other accountable like you're each other's coach to getting your dream accomplished. That's one of the most important things, especially when you're on a kind of solo mission with your vision. And to, to have another accountability partner is one of the best keys to success for you. Yes, definitely is. And uh, I think on top of that, we don't, it doesn't have to be like a big life coach or, or someone oh. famous. It, it can literally be, you know, one of your peers who's on this at the, on the same That's page. A beautiful point. I'm so glad you're saying this because we get caught up like, Oh, we got to get like a Tony Robbins or like a, a Mario or a V and or all, you know, you know, it's too much. No, you just need a good friend. That's also goal driven. In fact, that's actually better because your good friend is going to get on your ass about like, Hey, you said you were going to make five calls last week. You only made two. So this week you got to make, you got to make up for that. Like, I want to see you do that and mean it. Now, I'm sorry to cut you off, but you're so right. Keep going. Yeah, yeah. no, no, that's fine. Uh, just to wrap up with the last question now with everything that you've accomplished now and, and uh, many successes that you're going to have, what's the legacy you want to leave behind on that final day? You know, the beautiful thing about me for legacy is I want to write legacy as we're living. Um, so for me, you know, it's, it's about now. And, and the same thing now that I want, I would want at the end of my physical presence here. So I would want people to say that dude was full of integrity. Like he never wavered on his integrity. He didn't sell out. He didn't, uh, he didn't scam. He was really true to being as good of a human being as he possibly could be to others and led by that kind of example. So I would say integrity would be huge. Work ethic. This guy was a hustler. He, would, he strategically would go after something and he would just relentlessly keep trying. And if that didn't work, then he'd figure out something else that he would be excited about and go after. So the, the zest for life and the zest of fulfilling your purpose and going after it would be something that I would want people to feel that they should be able to do for themselves. Um, I would also want to, at, tangibly, I would love to have impacted millions of people with content and programming that they felt spoke to them in a way that helped them make a significant change in their life. Something that I said, or some guest that was on the show, or some segment that we did, unlocked something that could have been small or could have been big, but it unlocked something that empowered someone else's life and therefore empowered people that are connected to them. And so I think when you can have a ripple effect into the universe, that's the biggest piece of the legacy I'm looking for. I'm just looking to make a, to make a little dent into the universe and to say that, you know, I tried to make it a little bit better uh, than where it was when I got here. I actually want to try to make it a lot better than where it was when I got here. And I think that to me speaks to the biggest legacy of all. Have we created some type of roadmap that people can utilize for previous generations that they can use to move them forward in some way, that would be the ultimate legacy. Bro, you're doing that already. You're doing that already with your story, with everything that you've accomplished, you know, and the things that you've been through and, and the gold that you're able to share from everything that you've learned so far. So thank you so much for taking the time to share. Um, if people want to follow you on your journey, find out you know, more about you and what you're doing in the show, where can they do that? Oh man, I appreciate that because, you know, um, now that I'm subscribed to you and, and been checking out your podcast, I'm, you know, we have our, our podcast as well. It's, our podcast is a little different. So I would love anyone listening to this podcast. That means you're into this type of learning and type of development. Ours is mine is like four to five minutes every single day. So it's very short on purpose and it's meant for you to listen to it first thing in the morning. So every day you're supposed to get like this vitamin uh, of this podcast that gives you like lots of great, tactical advice that you can actually implement in your day, but it's only four to five minutes max. Um, the podcast is called Wake Up and Level Up. So I would love people to uh, search for that or go to wakeupandlevelup.com. And then the other, and sign up for the newsletter too, because uh, that'll also keep you uh, up to date with what we're doing with the Never Settle show. Right now we're in between seasons. 
The next season's going to be coming out in a couple of months, but that's when you can get tickets to come be a part of the show. I would love for anyone. In fact, if any of you listen to V's podcast and you're going to be in New York or you want to potentially even see your face on the show, I would love for you to reach out to me. Um, best way to do that is Instagram. Follow me on Instagram at Mario Armstrong. Lots of mentoring that I do there from the content that I deliver. I'm always giving a lot of transparent and tactical advice and storytelling, but I'm also in the DMs heavy doing a lot of mentoring. So hit me up on Instagram at Mario Armstrong and then uh, go to that Wake Up and Level Up um, podcast. And if you need it, I mean, one other quick little thing, if you need it, if you go to uh, wakeupandlevelup.com, we have a free action plan for 2019. So it's not too late. It's a free plan that you can download. It's a nine page worksheet. It's no skimpy thing. I'm giving it away for free and it's really gonna help you focus on how to, how to reflect on the pr previous year and your wins, but also what you need to focus on in the next 90 days to make your year that much more successful. So if you go to wake up and level up. Dot, oh no, you gotta go to marioarmstrong.com slash goals for that. marioarmstrong.com slash goals uh, for that. <laughs> Awesome. Well, no, I'll link all of that stuff below. Um, people can check it out and then we'll wow. shout about it as soon as this episode goes up, man. So no, thank you again so much. And I look forward to the next one. V man, it's been an honor and a pleasure, man. I really am inspired by the work that you're doing and the amount of consistency that you show brother, you show your commitment. That is one of the hardest things to do and you keep waking up and doing it. And so I really am honored to be on the show, man. And I appreciate being your, your first, but probably not your last Emmy award winner on the show, man. It's been a great time.